Hi guys, welcome to chapter 17, which is completing the audit engagement. So in terms of our audit timeline, this sequence of steps that we're going to go through is going to happen after the substantive testing over the various accounts is complete. Okay, so these are kind of the final few things we need to do before we can issue our audit opinion. All right, so step one is identifying commitments and contingencies. So we're going to start off with identifying contingencies, contingent liabilities. This slide is really just intended to be review so that you can remember what a contingent liability is, when we would disclose it, when we would actually recognize it and record the liability. So basically, if it is at least reasonably possible, you are supposed to disclose it. If it is estimable, then at that point, you are supposed to also record it in the financial statements, right? Record the liability and record a related expense. Obviously, if you're recording it in the financial statements, you do disclose it as well. Okay, so that's the probable estimable. I am recording it and disclosing it if it's at least reasonably possible and assuming it's non-estimable, footnote disclosure only. So in terms of our audit procedures, how does this relate back to that? So we have to, as auditors, we're basically concerned that management may try to understate contingent liabilities, right? We're worried that they might try to hide possible contingent liabilities from us. So most of our procedures around these contingencies are going to be making sure that we will have found any con possible contingencies that there might be so that we can make sure the company's disclosures are complete. We can make sure the company's recorded any that are, you know, probable and estimable, etc. So things that we're going to do, we're going to read through meeting minutes. So again, this is one of those things where we think if there's any contingent liability that's, that's really important and significant, it probably would have been discussed in a board meeting at some point. We're also going to do contract reviews, tax return reviews, reviewing letters of credit coming from the banks. More audit procedures would be things like actually doing inquiry with management, which is what we're seeing here. Again, some of these procedures are not the best, right, in terms of reliability, because obviously if management is going out of its way to conceal or hide these things from us, yeah, they're just, they just could lie and say, no, we don't have any contingencies. We're not aware of any contingencies. And then inquiry is... It's not going to help us out that much. But of course, you still have to do your due diligence as an auditor, which means you still have to ask, even if we all know inquiry isn't the most reliable procedure, at the very least, we do have to go through with it. We do have to ask them. And our hope is, okay, we're going to ask them, but yet we're going to try to corroborate what they say with actual evidence and documentation, right? So not only am I gonna ask them, but to support what they're saying, I'm going to get additional documents such as legal invoices. And if you've ever seen, had the pleasure of um, reading through an invoice from an attorney, you'll notice that they are incredibly detailed, right? Because lawyers, because their hourly rates are so high, so expensive, they go through a lot of detail to document what they're spending time on. So if you look at their invoices, they you know, are breaking down hours into 10 minute segments or 15 minute segments. And they are pretty detailed, like I'm working on a brief for case X. So it'll say precisely what they're working on during that time. So if I've inquired with management and they've said they're not aware of any lawsuits, and then I am looking at this invoice from one of their attorneys 
right? And if you think about it, we see things like legal invoices in the AP balance, right? Remember when we did the AP search and we saw that legal invoice from Lawyers R Us sitting in AP and it was almost $2 million or something like that. So you could go get a copy of that invoice and then examine it. And if you see the lawyers are billing them for all these different lawsuits and all this different pending litigation, that's <laughs> then, yeah, clearly they probably misled you during the inquiry when they said they weren't aware of anything. Okay. So that's how the attorney invoices can kind of help us validate whether management is telling the truth or not. The other thing we do beyond just getting invoices from attorneys is we will obtain a legal letter from the attorneys. Okay, so what is a legal letter? So a legal letter is kind of like a confirmation that we get from or getting from the lawyer. So like I said, we have already gotten information on potential litigation, claims against the company, et cetera, from management. And basically we are now going and corroborating that information that management gave us with this third party, with, right? We're going and asking the lawyer to validate this information. So it's very similar. We we have this set of information that we believe to be true, and then we go ask the lawyer, hey, tell us about all the outstanding litigation that you're aware of, and then when they send it back, not only does it kind of validate the existence of what management told us about, but it's also a good completeness check because they might tell us about certain items that management may have left out. So if we look here, we have an example legal letter. And a couple things I want to point out. One, once again, we notice that it is signed by right, CEO of Earthware, which Earthware is the company being audited. And they are saying, hey, please provide this information to our auditors. So it's very similar in format to these other confirmations where the company has to request on the auditor's behalf that information be provided directly to auditors. The next thing I wanted to point out to you is there actually is a materiality threshold in here. So the auditors, right, we're not interested in hearing about every little tiny $100 legal claim against the company because that could potentially take a lot of time, right? There could be a lot of possibly petty lawsuits against the company that would never come to fruition and that might relate to very small dollar values. So we wouldn't necessarily be interested in those, but we would be interested in any lawsuit that has the potential to be material. So in the legal letter, we do put in some kind of materiality threshold to, for the lawyer and we tell them, hey, we want to know about lawsuits basically that are going to be over this dollar value or have the possibility of becoming over this dollar value. We also tell the lawyers, hey, we not only want to know about lawsuits that exist as of the balance sheet date, right? That's what this 1231.13 is. But we also want to know about litigation through February 15th. Now, that February 15th date, that is going to be our audit opinion date. Okay. So remember, my audit opinion date is the date upon which I've gathered all the necessary information, all the necessary audit evidence to issue my opinion. So in case any lawsuit springs up, between year end and my opinion date, I want to know about it because it could have implications. Even if there's some lawsuit that springs up in January after year end, there still could be implications for the financial statements. And we'll talk more about why uh, later on in this lecture. And you'll notice we also ask the lawyer to evaluate the likelihood of unfavorable outcome. So we are actually asking the lawyer to tell me hey, is it probable? Is it reasonably possible? 
That's what we're asking them to tell us there. Or is it remote? Right, when we're asking them to tell us the likelihood. And notice here, we're also asking them for that estimate, right? Is it estimable? Is it not an estimable? And if it is estimable, about how much money are we talking here with this lawsuit? So this is also good because we know now, hey, these dollar value estimates, this sense of whether the lawsuit is probable or not, this information is not just coming from management who aren't legal experts, right? They're very knowledgeable about the company, but they're not legal experts. This information is actually coming to us from the lawyers who are legal experts. So that's the legal letter. And then number four, we are going to get written representations from management that all litigation, asserted and unasserted claims, have been officially disclosed. And we have a slide a little later on about management's rep letter, which is what this is referencing. But basically, there are several things throughout the audit where I make inquiries of management, and they aren't necessarily things that official you know, paper documentation can be provided for. Right, Because things that management just knows and management can tell me aren't necessarily things that they can prove with documents. Right, So management can tell me, hey, I'm not aware of any other litigation beyond what the lawyer has told you about. But there's no way for them to prove that to me beyond a shadow of a, a doubt. And so what we do for things like that, that there's no other way to prove them, is we have management prepare what is called management's representation letter or rep letter. And management writes out basically a long list of items and they are quote unquote repping to these items. And at the end, they sign the letter. So it's typically the CEO and the CFO saying they agree with everything. And this is, of course, stronger evidence than just merely us making inquiries with them and documenting it, right? Because it's an official letter, they have put their signatures to it. So it winds up being a little bit stronger, more reliable evidence since they've signed it. They feel a bit more responsible for it. Now for commitments, because we said this is both commitments and contingencies, right? So commitments will be things like purchase commitments right, that the client has made. So purchase commitments, the reason why companies might enter into these would be because they want to potentially secure availability of raw materials a long way out into the future. So sometimes companies will go into multi-year purchase commitments, or they might want to obtain favorable pricing over the course of a few years. So an example of a purchase commitment, if this is not something you are very familiar with, is Verizon entered into this purchase commitment with Corning, who is a maker of fiber optic cable. And the reason why they Verizon did this is they needed this fiber optic cable to help complete their 5G network. And back in 2017, when they were anticipating beginning to build up this 5G network, they realized there was going to be this shortfall in fiber supply. Okay, so they're anticipating there's going to be this shortfall in fiber supply. And we know when they kind of identify there's a shortfall in supply of something, that of course the price will likely go up. So what Verizon did back then is they decided they wanted to secure the supply, lock it down with this particular supplier, Corning. So they committed, entered in this commitment to purchase up to 12.4 million miles of fiber from them each year, beginning in 2018, lasting through 2020. This sounds like, okay, this is a good thing, especially if 
sort of a price per item or price per mile of fiber will be set. So this is obviously good if you're anticipating the price is going to go up, but if the price winds up falling, you're stuck paying that higher price, right? You're stuck paying this higher price that you've kind of negotiated for yourself. And long-term commitments, you can usually find them through doing your regular contract reviews, right? And also reviewing your board minutes, but also through inquiry. And typically, you'll find those commitments disclosed in company's footnotes. And when purchase prices change, whether it's unfavorable or favorable, relating to the original price you agreed on, those adjustments are wind up being recorded in OCI. 